Dreamland this week is fairly incredible. Medicine, miracles, and manifestations. John Turner and our terrific, popular, psychic medium, Marla Fries, is going to be doing the interviewing as only an expert can. So get set for a very extraordinary Dreamland. I've already listened to it. It is is something you will not soon forget. And you won't forget this either. Instead of doing the news right now at the top of the show, I'm interviewing the interviewer because Marla Fries last week had a completely incredible and extraordinary experience at the Sun Valley Wellness Festival. She took a picture. You can see it if you click on Dreamland, an extraordinary picture that we cannot explain. And I'm going to ask Marla right now, and you can go to Marla's website, MarlaFries.com. You can click through from there to her blog on on Marla Free's blogspot.com. Don't miss this. She had a remarkable experience at this festival. Marla, I'm so excited to have you with us. Hi, Whitley. Yeah, this is just one of those really amazing things that you don't recognize you're even having until you get home and develop your pictures. <laughs> well, yeah. now you developed your pictures. You, 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 they were, were they digital? No, they weren't. I had taken my old 35 millimeter camera with me. Okay, so these I, pictures that we're looking at, that I'm looking at right now on your blog, blog this is a 35 millimeter camera picture. It's yes. not a digital photograph, meaning that all the little strange glitches that come in with digital media are not part of this. This is an old-fashioned Kodak moment. And folks, what I am looking at is a photograph of a field with a little house behind it and some clouds. It is rather beautiful. But shining down out of the sunlight in the clouds is a very unusual angular shape. Now, Marla, why isn't this some kind of a lens effect? Well, you know, what, what's so odd about it, Whitley, is when I looked at the photographs and saw that one, I thought, oh, that must be a, a strobe from, you know, being near the sun or something. Yeah. But, but I also have two other photographs taken in different areas, and that image shows up in both of, all, all three of them, actually. And, and not even pointing at the sun in one case. Well, actually, yes. I mean, I, I was shooting to the north, the west, and the southwest. And I'd be glad to put those uh, or give you those pictures so that you could put them up on the website. Well, right. They will be up, folks, of course. Yeah. They're just extraordinary. What what has happened, Whitley, is, is the Wellness Festival was really terrific, and I had finished all my work, and I went for a walk, and I had been drawn to this area just to take pictures of the green. I thought that the extraordinary different colors of, of trees with the dark green and the light green, I wanted to capture that. And I kept hearing go out and take pictures, go out and take pictures. Well, I even had to go into town because the the, um, the gift store didn't even have any uh, uh, film at the time. So they drove yeah, me they're to get, town. That's getting kind of rare, Marla. Yes, I know. It was you have to start to making your own. Yeah, exactly. So I went out there, Whitley, and I heard, oh, shoot here, shoot here. Well, you know, Whitley. You, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You heard, shoot yes. here, shoot here. Where did you hear this from? Well, the way, you know, Whitley being a psychic and a medium, I listen all the time. So, so it was an inner voice. It came from, it didn't come, it wasn't someone telling you this. No, it wasn't. It was the way that I hear things. Fascinating. Was, yes. So I I wasn't even sure what I was taking pictures of. I just heard, shoot here, shoot here. So I did. And, of course, the next day I flew home and had the pictures developed right away. And it was so strange, Whitley. I didn't even see it at first. I was having lunch with a friend, and he looked at the photos and said, What's this? Yeah. And we, we were just... Well, that was my impression when you emailed him to me. I thought, What's this? Exactly. And, you know, people have seen these photographs. Um, Becky Andreas, and, of course, many of your listeners will know from her whole family. Oh, of Becky course. Andreas and we we know the Andreasons well. we got to have Becky back on again soon. Well, you, you have yeah. to have her back on. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, she looked at the photograph, and she just was in amazement. She says, Marla, this is the being that comes to me. This is the elder that comes to me and gives me messages. She said, this has been with me all my life. And Good I, Lord. I know. It was just stunning. And, and of course, Dr. Ling Kitai had 
sent a note through uh, saying, thank you so much for, for capturing this image. She said, this is what I saw. I think she saw three or four of them when I had my near-death experience. Now, Good Dr. Lord. Dr. Lynn, of course, is the woman behind the Flight Project. Yeah, and she's the, she's the person who originally started to have experiences in Phoenix before the Phoenix Lights and has been the, the, the apostle of the Phoenix Lights ever since. Well, and also, Whitley, she's, she's one that is told to go out and take pictures, too. She has told me many times that she has been told, go out and turn your camera on. And you know, I once, I once had visitors, they even told me the camera to get. Of course, <laughs> it, was, it was Whitley, so it turned out the camera was so complicated it couldn't be used in any way. I was, never mind. I, oh. <laughs> they were so strict with me. Go ahead, Marla, let's get back to this. This well, is exciting. Well, you know, the, the other thing is, Whitley, um, other people that have seen these photographs all have their own interpretation, and it's really created quite a little firestorm of interest. Um, someone mentioned to me the other day that they, that that image reminds them of the Andy Lakey, um, angel that came to him that Andy painted for years and years and years and did incredible art projects around that particular shape. So I just thought it was stunning. And then, of course, those friends of mine who have who are much more um, advanced in computer areas than I am started to blow it up. And as we were blowing it up, we saw various things inside the inside the uh, clouds themselves, other sort of winged beams, and there were some orbs. I mean, it's really quite a stunning piece. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I think I would like to have it developed and, and printed up, and, and um, I just ended up calling it the bean. Well, it's, it's really a very beautiful uh, uh, photograph. And in your blog, you describe it as possibly a nexus. What do yeah. you mean exactly by that? And what was the experience you had uh, that evening exactly? Well, I, I didn't know what a nexus meant. All I knew is nexus was a hair care product. But Dr. Mark Dunn... Yeah, it's a magazine, also, too. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mark Dunn, who is uh, one of the Matrix energetic pioneers, he and Dr. Bartlett, we interviewed Richard Bartlett last year, but... He's one of the people that has developed this matrix energetics, and of course he's gone off and is teaching on his own. But when I, when I, uh, talked to him about this area in front of the Sun Valley Lodge, he looked at the mountains and he said, well this is a coming together of, of energies. And he said, it feels to me like a nexus. And of course on the blog I give my definition by Webster's exactly what a nexus is. But the idea that this could be possibly layers of something coming together and merging. Um, in the dictionary, it talks about cellular uh, reconfigurations and combining. And, you know, I, I thought about that, and as I went on my walk taking those pictures and not knowing what I was actually taking photographs of, I was thinking, this is such an extraordinary place. And I have friends in Sun Valley that say lots of interesting sort of interne- uh, interdimensional things happen. Yes. But that night, on my way back from town, I, I decided to walk back. It's a nice three-mile hike. Um, the, the sky was starting to turn that beautiful purple iridescent color. And as it did, I looked at the ground, and it morphed right in front of me. Then there was a flash of light, like pink, then yellow. And I looked at my hands, and they turned fluorescent green. And I thought, wow. That one glass of wine that I had at dinner really kicked my butt. <laughs> that worked. That really now, worked. Now, how did you feel while this was happening? Did you physically feel any different? or? Well, you know, what was so strange is but when I was flying into Sun Valley, I was relaxing and had a vibrational shift. I just started vibrating all over when I flew into Sun Valley. And the work that I did, the, the, the workshops and all of the terrific presenters that were there, it they just really heightened, I think, my, my, my own vibration. And as I was walking, I was so stunned with what I was feeling, but it was, it was a buzz, Whitley. It was a very interesting buzz. Now, I've not had close encounters like a lot of you UFO people have had. I have only seen craft twice before in my life, but I've never had what I would consider an interdimensional shift. 
where my reality, as I saw it, right in front of my face, was changing. And it was exactly at the same place that that happened that night that I was taking pictures that afternoon. So something was there. Yeah. That is really, really fascinating. And it was there in a sense for all of us because it was there for one of our Dreamland hosts. Well, I love it. I I love it. I do too. Yes. And and to, to be able to come back and share this experience and have everybody connect to it in whatever they, at whatever way they feel is a connection for them is, is fabulous. It's, it's extraordinary. So if it is just a prism of light, it's beautiful. But if it, if it is something like I believe it might be, which is um, something that wanted to be shown, something that wanted to be seen, then I'm sharing it, and so are you with the world. Well, if yeah, if if it was just a a light effect, then it it really had something strange happened to your hands. You better look into that. <laughs> the, well, uh, I like that. The uh, the Marla's website is marlafreeze dot com, marlafreezeblogspot dot com. Also, you can read her blog there. You can see some of the pictures on our website on unknowncountry dot com. But the best place to see them, since we have a limited ability to put pictures up in the Dreamland uh, show description format, is to go to Marla's website and her blog, and you'll see them. So, Marla, uh, I'm very excited about the show that's going to come up. You're, folks, you're going to have a, you're going to get into miracles in a way that you never have before with someone who's had them in her life all of her life. I mean, that's what psychics kind of do, isn't it, Marla? Is is they do miracles? Well, I, I think that we sign up to have a journey, and if we're receptive, like I have been trained to be, um, then we can give everybody else an opportunity to see through our eyes, and hopefully people's awareness and their own intuition, which is a God-given gift, starts to manifest more for other people. And I, I truly believe the more that I hang out with psychics and interdimensional people, the stronger and the, and the more um, morphed of my own experience I happen to have. And, and I love sharing that with all of you. Well, you're going to be at the Dreamland Festival soon, so believe me, there's going to be plenty of power there. There are people come to that festival that you just would not believe. Last year we had orbs all over the place just to give, just for one thing, and with you there, goodness knows what might happen. Marla Fries, a woman on an extraordinary life journey, sharing it with us, and in a few minutes she will be back sharing another kind of journey entirely with you as she discusses medicine, miracles, and manifestations with Dr. John Turner. Thank you very much, Marla. She'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. Expert hosts, unique information. Hi, this is Marla Fries, and it is my pleasure to be spending Dreamland today with Dr. John L. Turner, who has bridged Western medicine and metaphysics in his book, Medicine, Miracles, and Manifestations. Welcome, Dr. John Turner. Oh, my pleasure, Marla. Thank you for having me on as your guest. Now, do you do your friends call you Jack? Yes, please call me Jack. All right. Well, why don't you tell our listeners how you got from Ohio to the big island of Hawaii to be its first neurosurgeon? Well, as I said, Marla, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to speak with you. And it was a psychic also who actually was responsible for my coming to Hilo and to be talking to you today. Really? Yes, and that was Edgar Casey. Yes. And the way this happened, Marla, I was a student in graduate school working on a Ph.D. in physics when someone handed me the book by Jess Stern, The Sleeping Prophet, about the life of Edgar Cayce, and that radically changed things for me. I, it was one of those books that you turn around and you read it a second time knowing that there's something really key there, and as a result, uh, I think within the next day or two, I switched uh, courses from uh, physics to metaphysics, so to speak, and the way I thought I'd go about it was to uh, go to medical school. Wow. I had never thought about that, but uh, it required me to take a year of organic chemistry and zoology. But then after medical school, I was led through neuro- neurosurgery and then to Hilo, Hawaii. So it was because of Edgar Casey and his extraordinary reading. Well, it's interesting. I'd like to go back to that moment where you were you were a student of physics, and then you decided to study 
metaphysics. And what was it exactly? I mean, the teachings, was it, did you have a dream? Were you just pushed? What was it, Jack? Prior to that, Marla, I had an interest in something metaphysical, and that was called astral projection. And I had tried throughout the college years to read the books about it and try to roll out of my body because I wanted to experience that. But I was never successful. But other than that, as far as metaphysical things and even religious things, I wasn't much into that. I was, you know, kind of a scientist at mind. And after receiving a bachelor's degree in engineering physics, which is the application of physics to real-life problems, I decided to get the Ph.D. in physics. And after taking all the coursework, I was ready to begin the research part of it all. And then after reading about Edgar Cayce, I, I was spellbound because I said, how could this man lay down, go into a trance, and somehow be in touch with an alternate type of universe or, or other dimension, and yet have this accuracy of approximately 85%. And as you know, he mixed his readings uh, with karma as well as natural type of healing. And I was never interested in medicine or illness until that day. So there was something about this other world. I don't know if you call it a spiritual world or other dimensions that he was able to down, contact and download this information. So that started me on a search about how to do that and, and to explore well, and you, that it, type of physics. That and it sounds point. as though you did it in the early 70s when astral projection wasn't really out there in the mainstream. It is now. Yeah, it is now. And I remember, I think it was books by Oliver Fox, people like that, and that famous book, The Projection of the Astral Body by Muldoon and Carrington, things like that I was reading. But there weren't too many people I could talk to about it. But once in a while, I could ask someone, well, tell me, what do you think about astral projection? And often they would know a little bit about it. We'd discuss it. But I was never successful. And uh, years later, I've been through a few marriages due to neurosurgery, I believe. <laughs> but I was able to contact my first wife, who knew me during uh, my undergraduate and graduate days. And I called one day to say, hello, and how are you doing? And she said, well, how are you doing? You, you're still down there laying on that couch in the basement trying to roll out of your body? And I couldn't believe that back then I was doing that. She wow. She reminded me. So well, you're also you're a, student of, you're a student of Robert Bruce's, is that correct? One well, of our I'm Dreamland favorites? Of Robert, I'm a friend of Robert Bruce's, and I've known him since he was working on his first book, Astrodynamics, which he published 10 years ago. So he and I have been in touch, and actually, my small book, the appendix at the end, I wrote for inclusion in his book. But his publisher, Frank DeMarco, who is now a friend of mine, too, uh, felt that his book was just too monumental, too thick of a tome to include anything more. So I was able to use that appendix for my work. But well, uh, Robert and I have talked about this, Marla, and yes. I, you know, I'm in awe of his teaching and his ability, but I made a split in my decision to experience astral projection and i think hopefully you may have read about that in one of my stories but yes, i decided I did. to try an entirely different path well i i'm very excited about the first story in the book i call it your de uh making deals with god <laughs> oh, that, <that's laughs> where good, where you run into this patient um mrs ibera yes. is uh, it ibera is that how yes, you pronounce ibera her name would be right, could you give uh, our listeners um a little snippet of what this story is about when you were in hawaii I'll be happy to do that. Uh, this is an important story, and for that reason, it starts out the book. And it has to do with an event that occurred uh, during a surgical procedure that I thought at first was routine, removal of a benign tumor intracranially from behind uh, this patient's eye. She was in her early 70s, as I recall. And it was a benign tumor, meaning, Marla, the treatment is to remove it completely. It and was after working on this uh, for about four hours total, we used a high-powered microscope and certain instruments that can remove uh, the tumor piecemeal. And when I had one small remaining scraggly bit of tumor, I told my assistant, after this, we can close up. And this after this was a whole different experience, Marla. Everything turned bright red as I removed that last part of tumor. And by carefully looking around, I was able to determine that it had invaded the carotid artery, the main artery that supplies the half of the brain on that side. And <clears throat> I felt I could repair it with fine sutures and small clips. So I began the process. And four hours later, I had made no dent into repairing that uh, arterial wall. We had replaced all of the woman's blood volume. 
Oh, my goodness. Yes, and, and the reason this is an important story is because at that point I did something that few other people have told me about. In fact, no one else. I've asked my colleagues have they had a case where they just couldn't stop the bleeding and and they said unfortunately they did and when i said well what, what did you do and they said well what do you mean what can you do when that happens what i did that day marla i took a deep breath and i i said a mental prayer i said if there is a higher power and i don't know if god is appellation or what but here's the deal i don't want to see this woman die on the operating table i said let's face it she came to me for help and i'm not helping her in this manner and I thought I was so good to take all of this tumor, that little bit. I said, I need this bleeding to stop now. I can't do it myself, so I'm asking for the help. Mm. Well, the bleeding stopped. Within 15 minutes of my doing the same things that had failed over four hours, when I released all the pressure and took a look, it was completely dry. Amazing. It was. But there's more, Marla. I said a second prayer. Again, I took a moment to say, wait a minute. Thank you for that. (laughs) I said, but there's something else. Now, after all of this, and she's going to live through this now, she could come out of this on the respirator, brain dead, paralyzed. Who knows with all this blood loss and time? I said, I'll make a deal with you. And that deal, as you mentioned, the deal with God perhaps was Mm -hmm. this. If you let her come out of this the best possible way, I'll try to be the best possible person that I can be. Oh. Now, she came out of that fine, and as you know from that story, later at her last office visit, three months later, she gave something to me, and that was a plaque with a Japanese inscription that basically meant peace. Mm. Now, here's the key to this story, <clears throat> is the power of prayer, because I met the author, uh, Bill Sweet, and I think Dreamland is familiar with him, because he wrote the great book, A Journey into Prayer. And I came across this uh, during studies after I wrote this book, and then being on as a guest on various radio shows, I mentioned the power of prayer as he describes it in his book. There are two types of prayer. One is a goal-directed prayer, and the other is non-goal-directed. Mm-hmm. And I see now that I did both types. The first was very goal-directed, in which I said specifically, this bleeding has to stop, and I'd like it to stop now. The second prayer, which is, type is shown to be even more powerful is called non-goal directed prayer it's basically a thy will be done type of prayer which yeah. you say let this happen in the best possible way for this person's highest good i guess is the way to put it and that's what happened she only had a slight droop of her eyelid and otherwise she was fine yes so you, you know Jack, that, that's that amazing power of prayer. And, and both of those both of those one with intention and then with intention but releasing it, another form of physics, right? Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's kind of a thing like here's the power, uh, let it go the best possible way. And I, I think it's all related to the highest form of giving. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that I think is to, all kind of giving is good. But if you attach something to it, uh, that may be good for people involved, but if you let it just do its own work, uh, that seems to be the best. Let this universal forces, these laws go to work. And, you know, with the power of whatever you're giving, be it prayer or help or time or whatever, do it in the in the highest possible good of all concerned, and it works out fine. Well, and I also like the fact that you added your your personal component in there, which is if this happens, I will be the best person that I can be. Well, I've been working on that, Marla. <laughs> and as I mentioned, uh, more than one divorce in the course of a neurosurgical How practice. many divorces, Jack? Uh, well, I think what happened in retrospect, and of course I mean this in the best possible way, I had uh, three weddings but no marriage until the fourth time. Oh. I think by then I had evolved to the point where I, I could work with people and understand people. And if I may interject quickly, I'd like to give credit to that, to Epictetus. Epictetus? He was a Greek philosopher born in 53 A.D., I believe. And he was born a slave, and his knee was injured on purpose, and he always said, I will let this uh, injury not make my mind lame, and he became a Greek philosopher. And one of his uh, quotes that I'd like to mention at this point is a tripartite quote. The first part says, to accuse others for one's own misfortune is a sign of want of education. Mm. Second part, Marla, to accuse oneself shows that one's education has begun. 
Mm-hmm. And the final part, the most important part, I believe, to accuse neither oneself nor others shows that one's education is complete. That's lovely. And that I, is really lovely, Jack. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think I, I've tried to follow that without knowing it until recently that this was his teaching. Well, uh, I'm working on that, too, and this is my first divorce. So, boy, if I don't have to go for, through two more to, to get it, I'll be very fortunate. Well, you know, I used to think three strikes and you're out with the phrase, but I think it's four balls and you finally get a walk. <laughs> well, let's take a break, Jack, and we'll be right back. All right. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online with guest host Marla Fries. Welcome back to Dreamland. This is Marla Fries, and I have with me Dr. John Jack Turner today. You know, in in following that story, you mention more of the uh, teachings later on in your book um, with Edgar Cayce uh, and your Association for Research and Enlightenment, the ARE Foundation. And you and I have some similarity in being exposed to uh, an entity, a Tibetan entity called Robazar Taras. Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, that's the way I pronounce it, too. I hope we're right on Wow. That. I was just stunned when I read that. Um, I was in the middle of a hospital having um, a myomectomy when this dude appeared to me um, the first evening after my surgery. Now, may I ask you that myomectomy is removal of of some muscle or something? No, myomectomy is, um, uh, I had a tumor uh, that was pendicular uh, attached to my uterus. And it was basically going in like a cesarean, and they removed that. And my first evening, I was visited by Robazar Taras telling me that I would have this energy removed out of my body and that I would be fine and it would be important for my my growth. Now, you had read Paul Twitchell's book? No, I'd never read Paul Twitchell's book. I actually had studied with an energy worker who had had Robazar Taras um, manifest himself in the back of a cab with her. Oh, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> did you hear me? How, was, uh, how did she describe his appearance? Well, apparently he is dark-skinned yeah. and very tall. And, I mean, this was quite a shock to me. I had heard about him, but I had never studied, um, how do you pronounce it, Ekinkar? Ekinkar. Yeah, Twitchell's Ekinkar teachings. But I had had my own experiences with um, channeling the Tibetan, the Alice Bailey Tibetan uh, Dwa Kul, the, uh, who Alice Bailey's books are, some of her books are based on. So tell us a little bit about your experience with this, uh, with this energy or this entity. Well, uh, you mentioned the ARE, and that's how Ekinkar came up. I happen to have uh, gone to the mailbox one day, and in there was my membership card, I think, from ARE or something at because I used to try to read as much as I could about Edgar Casey throughout the years. And my next-door neighbor saw me carrying that when we were talking, and he said, oh, come here, I have something for you. And he gave me the book, uh, one of Paul Twitchell's first books, which talked about Rebzartars, Rebzartars. Mm-hmm. And as you know, it's, the book is about, well, maybe you don't know if you have No, I haven't read book. it. Yeah, it's about uh, when Paul Twitchell, I think this was in the mid-'50s or something, uh, suddenly had the appearance of this dark-skinned, bearded man, uh, a Tibetan, that appeared in his bedroom to him as an apparition and began to give dictations, which he wrote down. Yes. Uh, it's similar in a way to the way The Course in Miracles came about. I don't know. Oh, I'm very familiar with that, yeah. But and I'm sure some of our listeners are. Yes. Well, what happened with Twitchell, this idea of Ekinkar was a way to to go out of the body and astral project along with someone who acted as a teacher to to teach at various places in the universe and other dimensions. And I subscribed to a year-long study of Ekinkar. There was a new way of getting out of the body that came every month. And for a month, I would practice that. I tried chanting the sacred name of God, which is Hu, H-U, and all of these things. But that year didn't prove to be fruitful, like my experiences in college. I, I just wasn't able to get any of these techniques to work. Hmm. And later, I met a man who, strangely enough, would be, uh, for all practical purposes, a look-alike for this Tars Tibetan. Wow. He was dark-skinned, he was bearded, and he was he spoke eloquently. 
And, it's and, totally and for our listeners, you are an African American, is that correct? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yes, I'm I'm dark skinned, a little tall, six two is a little bit tall. But this man who spoke with me on the beach, he was a neurosurgeon named Tyrone Hardy, who told me that the reason to do actual projection it shouldn't be for the sake of doing it. He said once you become enlightened this and many other things will start to happen. And that's when I broke strides with trying to force this type of event. Mm -hmm. And with all respect to Robert Bruce, I think his works are great, but he knows quite well that I've taken another path to try to see if, how these things can right. happen spontaneously. Well, I think it's just fascinating <laughs> that right in the middle of your book is something that has connected me to uh, the events and the, the note-taking that I had done for so many years from Dua Cool, the Alice Bailey material. So are you still in connection with this energy? Uh, when you say this energy... Uh, Robzar, Taurus? Well, here's what I would have to say about that. Uh, I've seen to do, I seem to do things in yearly periods of the time I was looking for a spiritual path. And one of those yearly periods was with Ekankar. And I went to the local... Ekankar Bookstore, there was one on the island of Oahu in Honolulu, and I purchased as many books as I could afford, and I read them all back then. Mm -hmm. And I tried my best to experience this astral projection for teaching purposes or so forth, but it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So what I did after that year, like other years I describe in my journey, I uh, tried out many other different ways, looking for that proper spiritual path. And then only at the end of all this do I realize that the path, at least in my opinion, is everyday life. Yeah. And I was on it all the time and didn't yep. realize it. Well, and you, you studied the healing techniques of Joe Ray. There is a photo of you in this book giving the healing application of Joe Ray through your hand to a patient that you are operating on. That's correct. And that particular type of healing, Joe Ray, you pronounce that correctly, means uplifting of the spirit in Japanese. And a man born in 1882, his name was Mokichi Okada, uh, on his path of enlightenment due to many hardships he experienced as a youth and in adult life, eventually was in contact with the spiritual world, and once more he received what he called a four centimeter spear, there's two and a half centimeters to an inch, of what he called a glowing light energy that lodged in his abdomen. And then he realized he could heal people not only by touching, by letting this light flow from the palm of his hand. Now, that was maybe in the early 40s, 30s, but what has happened nowadays, uh, we know from scientific instrumentation such as single proton detectors, photon detectors, I mean, that light is emitted from all the cells of the body in the ultraviolet range primarily, but also in the visible range. And interestingly enough, Marla, most of this light is emitted from the hand, and in particular from the fingertips of the hand. So Mr. Okada was on the right point, and he said, look, uh, uh, I, you can do these things that I do, and you can see for yourself. And he devised a way where people could share his, what he called a God-given light energy, as we know now, is part of this universal energy, the field, the matrix, whatever you like to call yes, it. Yes, yes. And that's the energy I feel I'm still in touch with, and I feel we're always in touch with it, and we're all part of it. Well, you know what, Jack, that's, um, that's what I've been studying with uh, the Matrix Energetics, the Bartlett um, seminars, where we two-point the physics of, of measuring between two points and seeing the photos, uh, the, the, the photons in between the points, putting the um, patient or the situation in the middle of that and measuring that and then just dropping the wave of photons to allow that zero-point frequency of the universal energy to come in and basically realign in its right resonance what's supposed to be there. Well, I have to, I'd like to read more about that. It's called the Bartlett Experience. Well, yes, it's the Matrix Energetics work, and it's, a trans, it's the most trans transformational healing work that, that I've been exposed to in the last couple of years. And you talk about reading Greg Braden's work. You're, you're a, a student of also Qigong, is that correct? Yes, Qigong, yes. Could you please tell us, well, you know what, let's take a little bit of a break and we'll come back and talk about Qigong with Dr. Right. John L. Turner. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. We go deeper. 
Welcome back. And tell me, Jack, tell me what what Qigong is so our listeners understand this. Well, the idea of Qi, uh, you know, you can write that in various ways, K-I or Q-I, but it's the idea of the uh, universal energy that we're all part of. And everyone, I'm sure, listening knows about the seven major chakras, although there are other chakra systems. But, but these areas, these seven areas, which are uh, color-coded according to the uh, colors of the rainbow, uh, which are easy to remember in the uh, mnemonic Roy G. Biv, from red to violet. Mm-hmm. But the idea with Qigong is to align this internal energy uh, for the purposes of well-being, basically. And I had the good fortune to study briefly under a great uh, master of this named Ken Cohen, who just uh, when I needed this and just when I developed an interest in it, he suddenly appeared uh, mm-hmm. traveling through Hilo, and gave, uh, Hilo, Hawaii, and gave a, a course. And I got a chance to not only meet him, but to learn these, uh, what he called primordial Qigong exercise, exercises. And also I uh, obtained his uh, DVD series, I studied more, and uh, I made this part of a daily practice. And it was just like everything else, it has its place at the proper time. So it's a good technique to know how to really focus more of this universal energy, gather it in and experience what the feeling is. So and I would highly recommend that as one of the ways to uh, do as you say, keep in touch with this universal energy. Well, and then you really went out on a limb and studied remote viewing. Well, I with guess everyone could, I'm sure is familiar with yes, that's listening could, right now. Yeah, you could call it out on a limb, and actually, strangely <laughs> enough, it began by a bird on a limb. Uh, my friend Martin Simmons, who was a webmaster for my site and dear friend who passed on recently, uh, years ago, was also interested in remote viewing. And on a chat site, Dr. Courtney Brown's Farsight Institute, uh, many gathered who were interested in this training. And uh, suddenly, in the point of a discussion, uh, he types in this. He said, if a bird was on a limb and had to fly up, down, or straight out, which way would the bird fly? Well, Marla, he was from London, and that's the slang expression for a lady is a bird, and I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and I said, okay, he'll fly up or straight up. I, I made a choice. But what happened? Uh, Ed Dames' partner, Major Ed Dames' partner, was watching in the background. This is Joni? Typed this is, in. Was this Joni at the time? That was Joni Durf. She mm-hmm. typed in. That's known as ARV, alternative remote viewing. Not CRV, uh, which no, is the controlled remote viewing. Remote. No, not coordinated remote viewing, ARV, alternative remote viewing, she said that's a way to play the stock market. Ah. Well, at the time, this was someone called Fox, and there are a lot of jokesters out there. And so I had studied remote viewing a lot, trying to plan how to learn it, and I thought I would go to Courtney Brown's Farsight Institute. So I said this. I said, oh, well, Ben, if you know so much about remote viewing, who is Indigo Duck? Right? Who is Indigo who? Indigo Duck, D-U-C-K. Okay. Well, the person said, come on, it's Ingo Swan, the famous psychic, that that's how we're moving. <laughs> that's started. right, Ingo, right. And the more questions I asked, I realized this person really did know about remote viewing. And I said, well, who are you actually? Well, and for our listeners, Ingo Swan is the psychic who sat down and developed the protocol for Hal Puthoff for the uh, Stanford Research. Exactly, a, yes. a real famous psychic. And, yes. and he could actually, if you gave him coordinates of a spot on Earth, he could tell what was there. So by studying him, they developed this program, Remote Viewing. Mm-hmm. So later I found out this was Joni Duroff who said that that she and Ed Dames loved Hawaii, and uh, this is how it all started for me. And because of that bird on a limb, it led to a training spot with Joni and Major Ed Dames in Hilo. They came to Hilo to spend an intensive three weeks uh, teaching me how to remote view. And oh, you, it did you... start with a bird on a limb. I was on a limb. You're it was right. not funny. I guess I was just being psychic. So um, so in your practice, in your medical practice, why don't you give our listeners an example of one of the stories that you share in the book about remote viewing one of the medical conditions? I'd be happy to do that because it's one of the stories, and it's the only time I tried uh, to utilize remote viewing for a medical condition because remote viewing, at least for me, is not something I can just spontaneously do. The process that I learned takes a pencil and paper and many hours uh, mm-hmm. to follow a specific series of steps that were developed in order to key in on a target with the accuracy of a good psychic. Yeah. 
And it takes a lot of work, And but I did want to give it a try. That was one of the reasons I wanted to learn it. So during that training with Ed Dames, I had one patient that I had discharged from the hospital prior to that three-week hiatus, and everyone, for all other purposes, felt I was out of town on vacation. But this <laughs> man had just had back surgery, and I said, listen, I, I'll be in town, although I'll be reported to be out of town, but I want to call you every day and make sure that you're doing well. And Ed knew nothing about this because I called every morning early before Ed showed up for the training. And this man had a very fluctuating course after his uh, second surgery for a back problem and leg pain. Mm. And it got so strange, I went over his house early in the morning to examine him. And some days he wouldn't have any pain, and other days if I'd push on his back, the pain would shoot down his leg, Mm. sometimes no pain. So what happened... uh, during near the mid part of the training, I said, Ed, I've got a, uh, something I'd like to run on you, a personal interest. And I have two four-digit numbers I've attached to a target. I want to see how you do as a remote viewer, and, you know, I'll be the monitor. He said, sure, do that. So I called out the two four-digit numbers that, unknown to Ed, I had attached to this target the cause of this gentleman's pain. Right, right because the, the numbers are actually... For our listeners, the target, we don't know what the target is, but the numbers are just the coordinates of like A, B, or C that you're giving uh, to the target. It's yeah, just so a I mean, random my, number, correct? Yeah, okay. for purposes not only of record keeping, mm-hmm. but the thought is that somewhere in the collective unconscious, that's discussed, discussed by Carl Jung, called The Matrix by Ed Dames, and mm-hmm. The Subspace by Courtney Brown, this is where... It is felt that all the information about everything is, is in there. there right. yeah. So anyway, somehow out there is the fact that these two four-digit numbers have been connected by me to a particular target. And it was up to Ed Dames now, by starting with that, to give me information about the target, which was the cause of this man's pain. And what was that? Well, it was highly interesting, and I've described this case on on a blog for people so they can actually see kind of the diagram that Ed drew and described. Oh, and, great. Well, yeah, it's also was, in your book. Yes, and, but, but the diagram was interesting because he drew a spiral pattern, flow of fluid. Mm. And he said, I'm localizing this to the lower part of the spine. Now, he had no idea that this was going to be a medical case or that I had operated on this man at all. But as I watched him, he finally drew a blockage point, he said, by a collection of something that's reddish-brown in color, and he drew it all out. Well, what I did, I went to see the man, and I explained to him he knew I was doing the remote viewing training, and I said, listen, this is what Ed Dames has come up with, and what I want to do, I want to do an MRI scan now to see what what's going on with this. And it showed this pocket of pus, an abscess that couldn't be seen from the outside. There was no indication of that. Hmm. The man showed no signs of elevated temperature, anything causing infection, but no, it explained you know, he... why. Pushing on his back caused leg pain. There was a direct communication near the nerve. And I put a needle in that, Marla, and I have pictures of that. Uh, on your blog? Product. It was a reddish-brown collection of pus. It was staphylococcus Oh, my goodness. And so that's on your blog, though, right, sample, Jack? I took that's... him into surgery, and he made a good recovery from that. It was just amazing. That is amazing. And you say it's on your blog, Jack? Yes, I have described it there, and I've... Uh, I'll put some more pictures to show what it actually looked like, but I tell you, it was a case of diagnosis by medical remote viewing. That's extraordinary. What What is your blog site, Jack, for all of our listeners? Well, it's my website, which is johnlturner.com, a list of links on the left, and uh, one of them says uh, view blogs, and they'll find it there. There's also a search feature, Marla, and something that may be of even more interest to your listeners will be if they do a search for the word ghost. Ghost? Then they'll see a little bit of information about how my great friend and webmaster who died uh, February 7th actually contacted me from the other side. You're That's kidding. How awesome. Well, it's, it's interesting. It's something that you can probably do naturally that I had to use an, an electronic method to contact you. Well, let's talk a little bit about that as soon as we come back. All right. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online with guest host Marla Fries. Okay, Jack, so let's talk about ghosts and remote viewing. <laughs> I, I love the combination. All right, hey, well, I need a good webmaster. Is he still working from the other side? 
Well, I'll explain that. Uh, there's also a Contact Us link, and it has my email address as well as Martin, who called himself Seth. Oh, so Seth, like like Jane Jane Roberts, Seth. Jane Roberts, Seth, and also you know that you since you mentioned her, uh, her books, The Education of Oversoul Seven, were great, and I think this is the way it works. Once we finish our reincarnations here, I think we go on to that type of level that she describes. But anyway, mm-hmm. for whatever reason, Martin chose this as his nickname on the chat rooms and for this website. And I never once asked him about Jane Roberts and Seth Speaks and all that. I, I just assumed this was it. So if anyone contacts him through that link and gets an email, I'd like to know about that. Oh, but my anyway. gosh, I'm going to do it immediately. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, here's the thing, Marla. As I mentioned, uh, Martin was interested in remote viewing. We became friends for years and speaking daily on the Internet. And then one day in November, as we had this website all ready to go, the book, as you know, was published just last March, but we had the website ready to go by the first of the year. Mm -hmm. But in November, I received a missive from a man named Rob Smith in Australia. And the reason I use the word missive on this email, (laughs) there was something very cryptic about it. Hmm. And what he said was, Dr. Turner, I got your link to your website through Robert Bruce's Astrodynamics. He said, in reading what your book is about, I know you understand what's occupied me for the last five years. Hmm. He said, it's something called EVP, and I'd like to have you join the Australasian Web Forum. And he said, I'll promote your book, but more importantly, I think you're going to like this. Well, of well, course. Tell, tell our listeners before you go in yeah, to this. I'm sorry, what I EVP skipped that. EVP is. is Electronic Voice Phenomena. Yeah. And I had seen the movie Frequency in the year 2000, and I have to admit, I didn't think much of it because I couldn't remember what it was about. But now that I am interested in the afterlife, I've gone back to review that movie, and it's an outstanding movie. But at the time I received this message, I wasn't that interested, but. As I read more about it, and I ordered the book by Constantine Raudayev about his over 72,000 recordings using yeah. a tape recorder, I said, let me study. And here's the key. I showed the email to Martin. I said, Martin, this is a friend, Rob Smith, who has contacted me, and I think I'd like to do another book project. I think I'd like to discuss consciousness and the afterlife. I said, now, you're a technical guy, Martin, a computer expert and all that. I said, would you like to join me in some research? He said, absolutely. Well, Marla, you'll appreciate what happened next. He developed a pain in his abdomen. And oh, over the boy. next two months, it progressed to the terminal diagnosis of colon cancer oh. with metastasis to his liver. Oh. And I traveled to London at the end of January, and I was there for his last uh, nine days. And the day before he passed, I said, Martin, uh, I'd like to bring this up again. Uh, are you still interested in EVP research. He said, absolutely. Well, when I returned to Hilo, uh, this link on my website, like I said, if you search for ghosts, you'll find a link to the cryptic case of Martin Simmons. Mm. And I want to say something right now important for the listeners. If they want to try this contact with the other side, they must know that I begin this discussion with a caution. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's because uh, and as you well know, Marla, some things that come through from these other dimensions may be a little frightening at times because there's all kind of things going on in all kind of places. And events. Yes, it, it can be tricky. Yeah, so I mentioned a couple of things they may want to read first because hearing voices in the head is closely related to hearing voices uh, on tape or on a digital recorder. But I go on to describe a way of doing something called a radio sweeping. Hmm. And that's to use uh, Steve Holte, actually, is a fellow, and I have a link there to his website, who showed how to take a simple uh, arm radio from Radio Shack, an armband radio you wear when jogging and so Mm -hmm. forth, inexpensive, open it up and cut one wire, Hmm. and it turns it into an automatic sweeping device so you don't have to try to turn a dial to get this static or white noise. And as soon as I put that together... I had a digital recorder right on the table, and I turned it on. I put it to the speakers, and I said, well, let me give it a try. I said, Martin, are you there? And within a second and a half or two, this voice came through as clear as a bell with an English accent, hello, and in his intonation. And it was absolutely fantastic. And when I asked people who have been doing this for years, why would I have immediate success? They said, well, well, face it, doctor. Uh, we get into this because we're searching for a lost loved one or we have an interest, but here 
You set this up right before your friend's passing. So we expect you to get great information. Wow. So I hope to use this and other things as a tool so I'll have something new to add to this study of the afterlife. Are you trying to tell me that people don't need me anymore as a medium? No, they can just go I'm to Radio not Shack? That at all. They can, no, wait, wait, they all can just go to have, Radio Shack? So we all may have <laughs> a taste of your abilities, Marla, but not developed to the point where we can really utilize them. So oh, I just the love the whole them. Radio Shack connection. This is great. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, this is so exciting. Well, my goodness, uh, Dr. Turner, Jack, what do you want us to think about uh, since you have been truly, I mean, you really are bridging this metaphysical world with, with medicine. You, you are a walking metaphysician as far as that's concerned. What as listeners and as seekers ourselves, what, what do you want to, us to take away from your teachings, your experiences, your book is just just phenomenal. And, um, you know, Medicine, Miracles, and manifestation, Manifestations, we all need a copy of this on our bookshelves. But what do you want us to, what do you want us to think about? Well, thank you for asking that question, Marla. And I hope you do understand that my purpose for being with you on Dreamland and also on any of the other radio shows has not been to try to sell any books. It's been to discuss the ideas that I discuss in the book that were my experiences and what yes. I've learned. So what to take away from it is, is this, and it, it probably could be summarized in one word, and that word, quite familiar to me, is aloha. Mm. Because for us in Hawaii, that word means yes, hello, it also means goodbye, but there's a more important thing connected with that word, it's the concept of love. And there is a lot of love in Hawaii, and I hope you've had the chance to visit many times. Well, no, but... and actually I'm sitting here thinking I've got to say to him, you've got to invite me, we've got to do seminars, we've got to get some other people over there and have an amazing festival. Maybe we can get Whitley involved in this too. Well, we could do that. I'd like to involve, that would be great, and Robert Bruce and Absolutely. I don't know if you know Anna Maria Hemingway, who wrote a great book, Practical Conscious Living and Dying. We've talked about the idea of seminars because I tell you, the, like most people who I hear being interviewed on any radio show about these things, they're saying the important thing is to get the word out. And that word for me now, and what I've learned along the way, and I've tried to go back to all the people where I didn't practice this type of love and ask for their forgiveness, what we're here to do, I think, the path is to learn how to appreciate and practice unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's going to take multiple incarnations here to go through these learning experiences, which, by the way, Marla, I believe we're actively involved in planning out before we incarnate. Oh, yes, 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 exactly. That's yeah. what I'm and writing then, about, too, Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we can reach that, which I believe is the apex on that tree of life, then perhaps we're going then to another dimension, such as Jane Roberts describes in that Oversoul series, where we're acting more now as guides to others going through this same period of learning. So if there's a message to leave, and there's the listener, all the listeners with, it's that that's the key to it all. Like Bernie Siegel said, it all has to do with love. Then we'll see the miracle. Well, it certainly is tough being human, and I think that that message, if we can embody that and, and my God, just try and focus on it, for a few seconds during the day would completely alter our lives. Oh, it would. And then sooner or later we'll get to the point where we're in that space all the time. Well, Jack, thank you so much for your time, your resonance. This, your, The book is filled with such great medical stories, and it, it's told in a voice that's wonderful to read. It's very easy. It's, it, it's comfortable. And I have a feeling that Ann and I, Ann Strieber and I, are going to have to get bathing suits, you know, and, and get over there to Hawaii. Yeah, please do that. You <laughs> and have, have, spirit some, have some fun with you. Yeah, well, yes, indeed. Let's do that. Oh, uh, we, we will make it a plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. John L. You know, he has seen these photographs. Um, Becky Andreas, and of course, many of your listeners will know from her whole family. Oh, of Becky course. We, we know the Andreasons well. we got to have Becky back on again soon. Well, you you uh, have yeah. to have her back on. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, she looked at the photograph, and she just was in amazement. She says, Marla, this is the being that comes to me. This is the elder that comes to me and gives me messages. She said, this has been with me all my life. And Good I, Lord. I know. It was just 
stunning. And, and of course, Dr. Ling Kitai had sent a note through uh, saying, thank you so much for, for capturing this image. She said, this is what I saw. I think she saw three or four of them when I had my near-death experience. Now, Good Dr. Lord. Dr. Lin, of course, is the woman behind the Flight Project. Yeah, and she's the she's the person who originally started to have experiences in Phoenix before the Phoenix Lights, and has been the the, the apostle of the Phoenix Lights ever since. Well, and also Whitley, she's she's one that is told to go out and take pictures too. She has told me many times that she has been told go out and turn your camera on. You know, I caught- once I once had visitors. They even told me the camera to get. Of course, it was it was Whitley, so it turned out the camera was so complicated it couldn't be used in any way. I was never mind. I oh. they were so strict with me. Go ahead, Marla. Let's get back to this. This well, is exciting. Well, you know, the other, the other thing is Whitley. Um, other people that have seen these photographs all have their own interpretation, and it's really created quite a little firestorm of interest. Um, Someone mentioned to me the other day that they that that image reminds them of the Andy Lakey um, angel that came to him that Andy painted for years and years and years and did incredible art projects around that particular shape. So I just thought it was stunning. And then, of course, those friends... The lens effect. Well, you know, what, what's so odd about it, Whitley, is when I looked at the photographs and saw that one, I thought, oh, that must be a, a strobe from, you know, being near the sun or something. Yeah. But, but I also have two other photographs taken in different areas, and that image shows up in both of all, all three of them, actually. And uh, not even pointing at the sun in one case. Well, actually, yes. I mean, I, I was shooting to the north, the west, and the southwest. And I'd be glad to put those uh, or give you those pictures so that you could put them up on the website. Well, right. They will be up, folks, of course. Yeah, they're just extraordinary. What what has happened, Whitley, is, is the Wellness Festival was really terrific, and I had finished all my work, and I went for a walk, and I had been drawn to this area just to take pictures of the green. I thought that the extraordinary different colors of, of trees with the dark green and the light green, I wanted to capture that. And I kept hearing go out and take pictures, go out and take pictures. Well, I even had to go into town because the the, um, the gift store didn't even have any uh, uh, film at the time. So they drove yeah, me they're get, town. It's getting kind of rare, Marla. Yes, I know. It was you have to start making talking. your own. Yeah, exactly. So I went out there, Whitley, and I heard, oh, shoot here, shoot here. Well, you know, Whitley. You, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You heard, shoot yes. here, shoot here. Where did you hear this from? Well, the way, you know, Whitley... Being a psychic and a medium, I listen all the time. So, so it was an inner voice. It came from, it didn't come, it wasn't someone telling you this. No, it wasn't. It was the way that I hear things. Fascinating. Was, yes. So I I wasn't even sure what I was taking pictures of. I just heard, shoot here, shoot here. So I did. And, of course, the next day I flew home and had the pictures developed right away. And it was so strange, Whitley. I didn't even see it at first. I was having lunch with a friend, and he looked at the photos and said, What's this? Yeah. And we, we were just... Well, that was my impression. When you emailed him to me, I thought, What's this? Exactly. Friends of mine who have who are much more um, advanced in computer areas than I am started to blow it up. And as we were blowing it up, we saw various things inside the inside the uh, clouds themselves, other sort of winged beams, and there were some orbs. I mean, it's really quite a stunning piece. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I think I would like to have it developed and, and printed up, and, and um, I just ended up calling it the bean. Well, it's, it's really a very beautiful uh, uh, photograph. And in your blog, you describe it as possibly a nexus. What do yeah. you mean exactly by that? And what was the experience you had uh, that evening exactly? Well, I, I didn't know what a nexus meant. All I knew is nexus was a hair care product. But Dr. Mark Dunn... Yeah, it's a magazine, also, too. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mark Dunn, who is uh, one of the Matrix Energetics pioneers, he and Dr. Bartlett, we interviewed Richard Bartlett last year, but 
he's one of the people that has developed this matrix energetics, and of course he's gone off and is teaching on his own. But when I when I uh, talked to him about this area in front of the Sun Valley Lodge, he looked at the mountains and he said, "Well, this is a coming together of of energies," and he said, "It feels to me like a nexus." And, of course, on the blog, I give my definition by Webster's exactly what a nexus is. But the idea that this could be possibly layers of something coming together and merging. Um, in the dictionary, it talks about cellular uh, reconfigurations and combining. And, you know, I, I thought about that. And as I went on my walk taking those pictures and not knowing what I was actually taking photographs of, I was thinking, this is such an extraordinary place. And I have friends in Sun Valley that say lots of interesting sort of uh, interdimensional things happen. Yes. But that night, on my way back from town, I I decided to walk back. It's a nice three-mile hike. Um, the, The sky was starting to turn that beautiful purple iridescent color. And as it did, I looked at the ground, and it morphed right in front of me. Then there was a flash of light, like pink, then yellow, and I looked at my hands, and they turned fluorescent green. And I thought, wow, that one glass of wine that I had at dinner really kicked my butt. (laughs) That worked. That really worked. Now, how did you feel while this was happening? Did you physically feel any different? or? Well, you know, what was so strange is that when I was flying into Sun Valley, I was relaxing and had a vibrational shift. I just started vibrating all over when I flew into Sun Valley. And the work that I did, the, the, the workshops and all of the terrific presenters that were there, it, they just really heightened, I think, my, my, my own vibration. And as I was walking, I was so stunned with what I was feeling, but it was, it was a buzz, Whitley. It was a very interesting buzz. Now, I've not had close encounters like a lot of you UFO people have had. I have only seen craft twice before in my life, but I've never had what I would consider an interdimensional shift where my reality, as I saw it right in front of my face, was changing. And it was exactly at the same place that that happened that night that I was taking pictures that afternoon. So something was there. Yeah. That is really, really fascinating. And it was there in a sense for all of us because it was there for one of our Dreamland hosts. Well, I love it. I I love it. I do too. Yes. And and to to be able to come back and share this experience and have everybody connect to it in whatever they, at whatever way they feel is a connection for them is, is fabulous. It's, It's extraordinary. So if it is just a prism of light, it's beautiful. But if it, if it is something like I believe it might be, which is... Dreamland this week is fairly incredible. Medicine, miracles, and manifestations. John Turner and our terrific, popular, psychic medium, Marla Fries, is going to be doing the interviewing as only an expert can. So get set for a very extraordinary Dreamland. I've already listened to it. It is is something you will not soon forget. And you won't forget this either. Instead of doing the news right now at the top of the show, I'm interviewing the interviewer because Marla Fries last week had a completely incredible and extraordinary experience at the Sun Valley Wellness Festival. She took a picture. You can see it if you click on Dreamland. An extraordinary picture that we cannot explain. And I'm going to ask Marla right now, and you can go to Marla's website, MarlaFreeze.com. You can click through from there to her blog on MarlaFreezeBlogspot.com. Don't miss this. She had a remarkable experience at this festival. Marla, I'm so excited to have you with us. Hi, Whitley. Yeah, this was just one of those really amazing things that you don't recognize you're even having until you get home and develop your pictures. <laughs> well, yeah. that's, now you developed your pictures. You, 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 they were, were they digital? No, they weren't. I had taken my old 35 millimeter camera with me. Okay, so these I, pictures that we're looking at, that I'm looking at right now on your blog, this is a 35 millimeter 
camera picture. It's yeah. not a digital photograph, meaning that all the little strange glitches that come in with digital media are not part of this. This is an old-fashioned Kodak moment. And, folks, what I am looking at is a photograph of a field with a little house behind it and some clouds over it. It's rather beautiful. But shining down out of the sunlight in the clouds is a very unusual angular shape. Now, Marla, why isn't this some kind of...